各位央视新闻的网友，大家晚上好，欢迎各位来到成都的午后。Dear viewers, good evening. Welcome to our special program at the Wuhotsi Museum, and we will continue to pay attention to the excavation in San Xingdui site. And we are having the special interview program tonight. It is the evening show of San Xingdui, and start from today, we will have four day of special program. And in the evening session, we will have a recap of what we found and what we discussed in the daytime. And actually, right now, the excavation work is still going on. Now, I would like to introduce my guest, Mr. Chen Deran. Before retiring, he used to be an archaeologist in the Sichuan Archaeology Institute, and also he works for the research center for San Xingdui site. Welcome to the show, dear viewers. Good evening. Mr. Chen right now is 68 years old, and at his young age, actually he dedicates himself to the work for the excavation of the San Xingdui site. So actually, when you are young, you have run into a big discovery of the archaeology. So I believe today you have followed up closely with the live streaming of CCTV. Yes, actually, when I wake up, I started to. Watch the television, and also sit in front of the screen to have a closer look of the excavation work. So now I would like to talk about uh, where we are right now. We are actually um, in the garden area of Wu Houci Museum. So now you could see for this area is actually the central axis with Chinese characteristics. So for this place, maybe I think it's quite uh, different uh, with the San Xingdui culture. Actually, we borrowed two treasures from San Xingdui site. So just pay attention to the screen. So here, by taking advantage of the 3D technology, I'm able to bring. The bronze heavenly tree inside of our studio. So on the table, I would like to introduce another treasure. If you look closer, you could see we have put a bronze mask with protruding eyes on the table, even though it is small in size. So this one is quite different from the relics that has been exhibited in the San Xingdui Museum. For this bronze mask with protruding eyes, when you discover this one, what do you think? Why this kind of bronze figure has a protruding eyes and big ears? For the ancient Shu people, they are actually paying a lot of attention to the eyes and the ears. So this pair of eyes means that. These people can see from thousands of miles away, and also they could even hear everything around it. So actually, they are combining some of the features of the animal into a human body. So when I look at the uh, bronze figure, I also paying attention to the nose. I think if you look at the nose, I think it's quite different compared to a human body. Yes, I think. It is more like a beak or like a bird. So in today's evening show, we have about like one hour to talk about the civilization of San Xingdui, and in the upcoming two to four days, we will also have this interview program, and also we will invite some of the guests. Um, to give us more updates about the discovery of San Xingdui. And first, I would like to turn over to my colleague, Mr. Zhang Pengjun. Hello there. So right now, we could see another reporter from CCTV, Zhang Pengjun, is on the screen. And actually,、uh, he is staying right next to a bronze statue, and、uh, he would like to give us a recap of what we have found、um, today. 
So actually today we have found a lot of amazing creatures, treasures. From pit three to pit six, we are able to reach the layer of the bronzeware and the buried objects. We are able to find some fragment pieces of the gold mask, and also we are finding some of the bronze figure, the J pieces, the bronze trees, and also we have some broken pieces of elephant tusk and other jade pieces. Altogether, we have around like 500 burial objects unearthed from the sacrificial pits. And actually today in the daytime live streaming, you are seeing some of the uh, collection uh, procedures to collect all of those objects. For example, we are focusing on the jade piece, the hollow tube endorsed by the rectangular body. And also we are able to find another bronze mask in one of the pits. And also it is very large in size maybe even bigger than the bronze statue we have right now. And another one which impressed me is a bronze statue with a human body holding a vase on his head. And also he put his arms in front of him. Also, we are finding, finding a wooden box. We are not sure where this wooden box comes from and what are the objects inside of the wooden box. But today, with the excavation, we think it's quite amazing to see all of these treasures because these treasures have been sleeping for thousands of years. So when they woke up, they tried to impress the world. And the second word I would like to um, describe the discovery today is um, origin. For example, the jade piece, what we call Tong in Chinese, it is actually a hollow tube surrounded by the rectangular body. For this kind of jade piece, it used to be found in the Zhejiang province. So in terms of the space, I think Zhejiang is over like a thousand kilometers away from Sanxingdui. If we look at the time period, I think it has over like 5,000 years of differences. Despite of the space and time differences, still we could see this kind of civilization has been passed to Sanxingdui site. So I can feel the origin of the uh, civilization in China. So when we are visiting the Sanxingdui site, and also we hear a lot of questions uh, from the viewers and they're saying we see a lot of strange stuff. Will the um, Sanxingdui civilization represent the alien civilization? Actually, that is not the case. We used to found some potteries, bronzeware, jade pieces. All of these shows that this place is also part of the origin of the Chinese civilization. And the third impression, I would like to emphasize solidarity and cooperation. This time when I come to the excavation site, I feel quite uh, confused. Because in the past one year, uh, I still remember when we are fighting the pandemic, people all wearing the protective suits. So when we are coming to the excavation site, I'm so confused that I see so many archaeologists, they're also wearing the protective suits. And then I talk with them. I know when we are fighting the pandemic, the reason why we're wearing the protective suits is to protect other people. And this time, when we are wearing the protective suits, we're trying to protect the cultural relics because we do not want to bring other materials inside of the excavation site. So that's why I emphasize a solidarity protective suits. I still remember when we were supporting Wuhan in the fight against COVID, uh, people speaking uh, different dialects and uh, come to Wuhan to give us support. And this time on the excavation site, we also have people from different cities to support the excavation. And I believe this time we have over 30 research institutes and uh, universities, they are participating in the excavation work. 
So this time, the Chinese people have held hands and also formed the synergy for the excavation. <laughs> it seems like there is some signal issues. Or actually, I have a lot to share. Please give me more time. All right, I just speak about the solidarity and the synergy. And also, I saw some of the burnt elephant tasks. So this time, we are seeing some of the people from the fire service department. They are trying to recover the elephant task. And the fourth impression I would like to say is the all-out efforts. When I say all-out efforts, referring to some of our hard work. For example, this time we have built some excavation shelters to preserve the cultural relics. We always talk about how to preserve the relics after these relics being unearthed. So when we are entering into the excavation site, we could see on one side we are doing the digging, we are trying to uh, collect all of these relics, and on the other side we have a 3D printing room, and we are putting some of the shields to protect the relics, and then we transport some of the unearthed relics to laboratory. So this means all our efforts. Except for the on-site work, we also doing the live coverage of the whole procedures for the excavation. Another impression from my side is I was so shocked by the discoveries. We always talk about um, it is very difficult to follow the path and enter into the Shu Kingdom. And also, it is very difficult for the Shu king, Chan Chong, to inaugurate a nation. So when I personally visit this place, I actually impressed by the spirit of archaeology. I hear a lot of stories back in the Shu kingdom. Today, when I'm at the excavation site, I could see some of our archaeologists. They're actually standing on the elevating platform to do the excavation work, so they do not have to step on the soil of the pit. And actually, they told us uh, we should not wear shoes with heels to step inside of the pit. Actually, that used to be a problem for some of us. However, we have improved our technology for the excavation. That's why we are setting up this kind of a hovering platform. This also represents the strength of China and the development of the technology. And in the past, I remember for some of the archaeologists, they always require we need to take aerial photos because in the past, we are not able to know what is the uh, environment of San Xingdui site. So one of the young archaeologists said uh, when he was looking at the airplane flying over the site, and he is asking us uh, whether we could take an aerial photo. So actually 20 or 30 years ago, it is never imagined that we could take such a photo. But nowadays, it is quite easy to do that. So we all know that right now China is getting stronger, and all of these relics will stay inside our territory. And also we have the all-out efforts from different sectors, and also we have a cutting-edge technology for us to do the excavation. And the last impression um, is uh, I was quite impressed by the, the bronze statue with the protruding eyes. So we are all curious about the protruding eyes. That goes back to the story of the ancient king, Chan Chong. So that, that's why they make the eyes so big and so exaggerating. And also, it represents the spirit of Chan Chong. 
and showing that he has a very good vision for the development of the Sichuan province. So actually, that, that is my summary. Because I use, just used six words to describe my impression about the Sanxingdui site. And actually today, um, many people coming to the Sanxingdui site. And it's just like a holiday. And because every one of us is expecting to see some of the new discoveries from Sanxingdui site. And also I could see the smile on the archaeologist. It feels like just, they're just like kids. Even though today is not a holiday, but still I can feel the festive mood of all of those archaeologists. I hope all of us can stay true to our original aspiration and discover more treasures. Back to you. So Peng Jun, as you are looking at so many different relics, do you have any questions about those treasures? Because today we have an expert with me. Patrice is the leader of the excavation team back in 1986. Well, actually, I have a lot of questions. So for example, I have a question about the, the jade piece, the tomb, because when I see the jade piece on the first side, actually, it is quite dark in the color. Does that mean this kind of jade piece being burnt? And why this jade piece being burnt? And also this time, I'm able to see some of the unearthed treasures, the wooden box. In the sacrificial pit one and two, we never see any of the wooden objects. And this time, we are able to find this wooden box. So what is this wooden box? What are the objects inside of the wooden box? So when we are looking at the Earth's conditions, is it possible that we may have to change of the division of the dynasties? For example, is it possible for us to find some of the seeds? And can we find out more mysteries about the society of the Sanxingdui civilization? So thank you very much for your insight. So actually today, I believe many viewers are stay tuned with our special program to unveil the mystery of Sanxingdui. So when we try to uncover the history, it is not that we uh, totally resolve the mystery. Once we found some new treasures, maybe we have more questions. So as my colleague Peng Jun just said, when we are seeing the Yu Tong, the jade piece, and actually it is quite dark in color. And actually in the Jingsha site, when we are seeing some of the jade on earth, actually it is quite dark in yellow and white. So what is your interpretation about the color of the jade piece? Well, today we could see the jade piece is very dark. There may be some possibilities. First, maybe the material to make the jade is in dark color, maybe black color. Actually, this kind of material can be collected from Dabashan Mountain and also in number one and two sacrificial pit of Sanxingdui, we used to discover some of the black jade. Maybe that is the original color of the jade. And the second, maybe we are dyeing the jade tablet with the black color. Because in pit one and two, we could see on the surface of the jade tablet, it is dark. However, if we look at the section, it is in white. The third possibility, it is the contamination. So maybe the jade was burnt. And maybe it is carbonized and becoming dark. So during the burning procedures, there may be some elements that interact with certain pieces of the jade, and then the black color stained the jade. However, we need to do more analysis to better understand what happened to the jade piece. All of my assumptions are just pure speculation. 
Once again, I would like to thank Peng Jun to raise all of these questions. And this is the special pro program to unveil the mystery of San Xing Dui. And there is a regular interview program, the evening show of San Xing Dui. Welcome to join us. And also, what the colleague raised a question is about the wooden box. And he is quite curious about the wooden box. Because in the pit one and two, we are not able to find some of the wooden objects. So, what is this wooden box? According to my understanding, located at the length and the width, it is quite large in size. So probably, maybe it is a coffin, a wooden coffin. Maybe the king of Shu was buried in this wooden box together with other burial objects. So this is also a speculation. From 1980s to 1981, we started the excavation work in Sanxingdui, and also we found major discoveries in 1986. After you retired, well, I would say maybe you spent your life for the discovery of Sanxingdui. Yes, indeed. Actually, I am with Sanxingdui for decades. Even though I retire right now, I still pay close attention to the discovery in San Xingdui. For example, the excavation work, the display of the relics, the preservation of the relics. I always pay attention to anything related to San Xingdui's site. So actually, before the live streaming, I chat with Mr. Chen. So actually, I was quite touched by Mr. Chen even though he was retired right now, but he is actually an expert in researching the San Xingdui site. So you have every reason to enter into the excavation shelter to look at the pit 3 to pit 6. Have you ever been to the excavation site? Yes, I've been there before, but I didn't get inside. I remember one time the archaeologists invited me to step inside of the pit to have a closer look. But actually, the pit was quite narrow in size. I do not want to affect the excavation work. So I just look into the pit from outside. I'm quite satisfied. But I understand that you really want to step inside of the pit, but you are very professional. You do not want to have any damage of the ruins, the sacrificial pits. I believe you love San Xingdui so much, and then you wouldn't want to have any impact to the discovery and the excavation work. And soon maybe we will see some of the live footage about the excavation work right now. For all the archaeologists, and right now we have better technology, so maybe it's possible for us to do the excavation 24 hours per day. So when you are looking at the equipment, especially the elevating uh, platform, so people are able to work on that operation platform to clean the relics. I believe this is more convenient for the archaeologists. And today we have seen some of the pieces of the gold foil, and some people are saying maybe these are fragments, or maybe these are the decoration of the wizard, or some of the uh, leaves of the bronze tree. And there are a lot of like guesses and the speculations. Have we ever found um, some of the small size relics in the past? Yes, we did find some of the small size ornaments. But they have a hole or a hooker, so we think maybe that is the uh, decoration attached to the bronze tree. So on the left side, you could see the live footage on the excavation work. Uh, you could see for our archaeologists, they are actually working on the operation platform, the elevating platform. Tens of years ago, when we enter into the pit, we need to find the shoes without heels. Actually, that is true. 
because we do not allow our workers to wear shoes with heels because the heels may damage the soil. So we have to wear some of the flat sho shoes to walk into the sacrificial pits. In the past, when we are doing the field archaeology, we always say we are doing a rescue work for the archaeology. <laughs> so I think it requires a lot of hard work for our archaeologists, so you should not be too chubby because we are worried that maybe they will damage the soil. Well, yes, you need to be very fit and because sometimes you have to take a spot position for hours, so you need to be very strong for your physical condition. Back in 1986, we found two sacrificial pits. When we are cleaning all of those relics, we need to have some of the slim archaeologists to go inside of the uh, pit to clean all of those relics. So we need to find those people with tiny body shape to enter into the pit to clean all of those relics. And I could see some of the comments from the viewers. They always say Mr. Chen is very lucky because when he was young, he's able to participate in the excavation work of San Xingdui, and he's lucky enough to find some of the great discoveries. So for the San Xingdui relics, even though that is the, not the most unique uh, treasure, but still I think it is carry in rich civilization. So how many pieces we found back in 1986, do you remember? I think over a thousand pieces of objects in pit one, a uh, pit two, and some of them are in pit one. So if you pick two favorites for the excavation in 1986, what are they? So first pick is the uh, bronze standing statue, and the other one I pick is the bronze mask with the um, protruding eyes. So you will not pick the bronze tree. Well, there were many bronze trees. It's not the only one. So I think we need to find those one and only pieces of the relics. So on the right hand side from the screen, you could see there was some of the footage back in 1986. So this is the time when we are collecting the bronze standing statue. Back in 1980s, we do not have the hoisting machines, so we use the um, manpower to lift all of those, the bronze statue. So Mr. Chen is actually participating in the lifting of the bronze statue in person. So right now when you're looking at the footage, so how do you feel? In the archaeology back in 1986, I believe many relics have been broken down into pieces before they are being buried in the pits. So what is the situation of the bronze standing statue? So actually the bronze statue has been cut into two parts. And also the foundation fell off from the bronze statue. So when I saw this uh, bronze statue has already been restored and it has been displayed in the San Xingdui Museum, but back in 1986, you can see there's no foundation of the bronze statue and also there's no form of the bronze statue. So can you tell us what is the reason behind it? Is it because this statue was deliberately damaged by human or is it because it has been buried for thousands of years and then it was damaged? Well, it's hard to say. Maybe this kind of statue may suffer from earthquake or this statue was damaged by human beings. On the left side, you could see the bronze standing statue. 
So not to mention the bronze tree, maybe it has been broken into thousands of pieces. And it has taken us for over 10 years to restore the bronze tree. And also, the top is still missing for the bronze tree. So as you have been dedicating yourself to the discovery of San Xing Dui, do you expect to see the top of the bronze tree in the new sacrificial pits? Is it possible that we are able to find the missing piece of the bronze tree? Well, actually, we are paying a lot of attention to the pit number three because we see so many decorations, ornaments buried inside of the pit. We hope some of the ornaments can be tied up to the bronze tree. <laughs> Actually, today I have changed my mindset because today I see some of the rectangular vessels and it is quite different uh, from the vessels that has been unearthed from peak number two because the uh, rectangular vessel unearthed from peak three is quite tall. So I think the number three sacrificial pit comes later compared to number two pit. But still, we think it is possible to find some of the missing pieces of the bronze tree. If those missing pieces are not in the sacrificial pit, maybe these missing pieces are buried in other areas. So I would say all the archaeologists, they are quite romantic. So I believe you always have dreams. So have you ever dreamed of any of those bronze masks? For example, whether this bronze figure like talk to you in your dreams? Have you ever had this kind of dream? I, I want to have this kind of dream, but I never have. You're quite realistic. And today and nowadays, we have a number of these different kinds of pits from number one to number eight. So maybe uh, this is the sequence we are naming. But in the future, maybe we will renumber these pits according to the division of the time period or the division of the dynasty. Is it possible? Well, for the number of the pit, actually, it is subject to the time of our discovery. So right now, we are actually uh, identifying number one pit at an earlier date. That's why we name number one pit as number one. As for the division of the dynasty, we still need to do more work to identify the times. If we look at the numbers, it is actually according to the discovery time. And also, if we look at the layout of the uh, pits, they're actually lining in three lines. Basically, three pits are forming one line. So right now, we have many speculations about the division of the time period of different pits. As for the ranking and the sequencing, we must give a reason to number all of those pits. So either by the division of the dynasty or either by the discovery time. Maybe we are also using some of the dynasties to name some of those sacrificial pits. All right, we will go back to some of the relics. We are able to found some of the treasures back in 1986. Actually, the bronze standing statue used to be one of the favorite of Mr. Chen. And uh, I still remember for the bronze statue, it has a special gesture. And a lot of people are wondering what it is holding. So actually, it is open for imagination. So if you ask what the bronze statue is holding, and then there are a lot of speculations. Just take a look on some of the imaginations from the viewers. 
这个，我我们先不问专家啊，这个我相信您可能有自己的这个猜测，我们先先不着。Well, this is just an imagination from the viewers. Maybe you have your own speculation. And also, I would like to um, connect with some of the young archaeologists, some of the students of archaeology, to speak with us about the discovery of Sanxingdui. So maybe first, we will invite uh, the students from the Renmin University. Dear viewers, good evening. I'm Guo Yuanzhe from the Archaeology Department of the Renmin University. I'm also holding a bachelor degree in the archaeology from Renmin University. All right, it's turn for the two young ladies from Peking University. Good evening, everyone. I'm from the archaeology department from Peking University, Du Xingyi. I'm also from the archaeology department of Peking University. My name is Liu Huiyun. So we start with the ladies. First, I would like to ask a question. So we just showing a video for the uh, bronze standing statue. So what do you think what it is holding? According to my research, I think maybe the bronze statue is holding the elephant tusk because I pay attention to the details of the bronze statue and I think that this figure is very important for the sacrificial events and according to his gestures and the positions maybe he is holding something for the sacrifice and also in San site we unearth a great number of elephant tusks meaning that the elephant tusk is highly associated with the sacrificial activities. If we look at the shape of the hands of the bronze statue, so I would say maybe this bronze statue is holding the elephant task. Do you agree? Yes. I want to add some of my comments. One of my teachers told us that in the pit number one, and number two, there are many elephant tasks. And also, we all believe that all of these uh, sacrificial objects have been buried in pit one and pit two. And also, for the bronze statue, we could see this person must have a high ranking status. Maybe this figure represents the god, or maybe it is a wizard or a priest. So, I think. It is possible that this person will hold some sacrifices and offer the sacrifice to God. And actually, if we look at some of the objects on Earth for the Jingsha relics, we also found the elephant tusk. So in ancient times, the elephant tusk is used to be considered as an important sacrificial offering. So you have very good answer. So first, I would like to ask the students from Renmin University, do you agree? First of all, thank you for your introduction about the Sanxingdui civilization. You two actually have given us a lot of basic knowledge of, of Sanxingdui. As you said, if we look at the shape of the hands of the bronze statue, But still, I have my own opinion. You're quite right that there are some elephant tasks uh, coming out uh, from the Sanxingdui site. But also, we are able to find a lot of like jade wares in the Sanxingdui site. I think the jade is also an important sacrificial object for sacrificial activities. So it's possible that the bronze statue is holding jade ware or the bronze statue is holding two different things. So what about you, Miss Tang? So actually, I have different opinion with all of you. 
if it is an elephant task, I was thinking maybe it is not the way because it's very difficult to have a balance to hold the elephant task. If the jade, and um, maybe it is a jade piece or jade tablet, but if you look at the shape of the hands, maybe it is very difficult for the bronze statue to hold hold up to the jade tablet. So I think maybe it is some sort of woodware or wooden objects. So I believe this bronze statue may be a king. So if he is a king, it is not important like what he is holding. So maybe it is a different imagination. So my question goes back to Mr. Chen. So I believe many people are thinking that the bronze statue is holding the elephant task. As you are dealing with these like bronze statue for many years, so what do you think? What do you think the bronze statue is holding? So first we will look at the position or the posture of the bronze statue. One hand is higher than the other. It is possible that um, the bronze statue is holding the elephant task, but I don't agree with this opinion. For the J tablet unearthed from Jingsha site, I believe uh, we see a bronze figure carry a elephant task, meaning that the elephant task is very heavy. So it is not possible that these people are able to hold this elephant task on their hands. So maybe we could weigh the elephant task this time to see how heavy it is. And also in sacrificial pit number two, we are un we are able to unearth the um, J tablet, and uh, looking at the patterns that actually the elephant task is not with hands, but actually some people are carrying it with their back. So for the elephant task, maybe it will be used to drive away the evil spirits. And sometimes if there is an earthquake, people may try to put some of the elephant tasks to consolidate the cement and the ground. So if we look at the significance of the elephant task, it will be used to drive away the evils. So even though elephant task is used to be a sacrificial object, but I don't think it is an ornament for a figure to hold. And also in later stage, we are also able to find some of the teeth of some ancient beasts, for example, the tigers, the wolf, and the hawks. And some people are using the teeth and the task to drive away the evil spirits. And for the bronze statue, I believe uh, it represents the god. So I think uh, he is just holding a gesture to offer the sacrifices to God. So he's actually equal to the priest. He is trying to offer the sacrifices to the God. If you look closer of the gesture, and if you look at the hat or the ornament of the thrones, maybe one representing the king and the other one representing the relig religious leader. Well, actually, the charm of the archaeology is that we do not always have a standard answer. We have to keep discovering and to unveil the mystery of the history. So just now, Mr. Chen has shared his insights, but of course, it is open for discussion. But most important thing is that you should pay personal visit to the field. Just keep fighting. And welcome to join us in today's show. See you next time. And now I would like to go back to the sacrificial pit. And some people 
want to see what's happening out there. Maybe Mr. Chen also wants to have a look at the excavation site. All right, uh, let's see what happened in the excavation site. So I will give you an assignment and just explain what they're doing right now. All right, uh, let's see what we are doing right now at the excavation site. Maybe we should come closer to the screen to see what's happening there. This is the excavation site for San Xingdui. And right now we could see the archaeologist is actually uh, lying on the elevation um, platform and he is trying to use some of the film to cover, I believe, cover the elephant task. Well, we need to go back to the live footage. All right. Well, actually, this is a photo. Right now, we could see um, these elephant task was wrapped by a film. So around these um, elephant task inside of the pit, you still see some of the marks of burnt. It feels like some objects are being carbonized. We are not sure whether these are marks by the flames or the carbonized objects. So if you look closer to the pit, I think some of the marks will live outside of the pit. So first, um, the, those ancient people will burn all of those objects, and then they will throw all of those object, objects inside of the pit. So I'm not a professional in the archaeology. So the first impression of myself is I see the black mark. And for this kind of information may be quite distracting. So you need to understand what is the correlation of the traces inside of the peat and the relics. And this time, the excavation work is quite similar with the excavation work for peat 1 and peat 2. So first, you dig up the first layer of the earth. So after that, you may be able to see some of the elephant task. What's beneath the elephant task? Well, according to my experience, maybe there may be some bronzeware. And below the bronzeware, there may be some jade pieces or other small fragments. So it feels like um, the ancient people piling up these different fragments or pieces of the objects. When we look at the pit 1 and pit 2, especially for the J tablets, I believe they burned these J tablets in one place and then put it into the pit later on. So they will burn the bronze statue, the bronze mask. And for some of the pieces, um, they may not um, destroy it because they have to use it. For example, the J tablets, they may hold the J tablet first after they complete the sacrificial ceremony and then they burn these sacrificial objects. So during the um, burning, and sometimes the ancient people may hold these objects and burn some of those objects, or sometimes you just like throw it into the fire. So for the J tablet, we could see for some parts are black and some parts are in original cover. color. It is because these ancient people, they are still doing the sacrificial activity, so they have to hold on some part of the J tablet. And for some pieces, they just break down into pieces and throw it into the sacrificial pit. In Shanxingdui site, also people are holding the golden rod. 
And goldenrod is also a representative object for the priest to hold on to their hand. And also there is a sequence for them to put different pieces inside of the pit. It's not like they throw everything at one time inside of the pit. There is some sequence to do it. I think this is quite interesting, especially when we are studying the history. So when you are analyzing the history, sometimes you may have an imagination about the height of the ancient people and also their gestures, their hairstyles and also their costumes, etc. But we have to do it for several times. We have to look at every traces we found in the archaeological discovery. And we need to find out a reason behind all of their behaviors. So it is just like the source code. So and then it means that we have seized the key information. Special thanks to Mr. Chen to join our special interview program. Actually, today Chengdu is very cold. Thank you very much for joining our special program and share some of your insights about the mystery of Sanxing Dui site. Wish you good health and a bright future. Hopefully, in the future, you can help us to uncover the mystery of Sanxing Dui. All right, thank you very much. Now we are about to connect another person. I'm not sure whether you can recognize his face. So now I'm about to connect Nan Pai San Shu. And actually today um, he appeared on the search for the hot topics. He is actually a author of a novel. So actually today I'm quite panicked. I should not take up some of the public resources. So actually the reason why you are appear in the search is because today we have unveiled some of the new discoveries of San Xingdui. I believe in one of your works, you actually mentioned the bronze tree. Why you mentioned the bronze tree? Is it because bronze tree is one of your favorite tree? Can you tell us more about the background? I believe in the textbook, I already know what is the bronze tree. And when I'm writing the novel, when I research, do some of the research, it is quite common that I think of the bronze tree. So when I'm writing, when I'm searching for the information, it is inevitable that the bronze tree come across my mind. I am actually quite impressed by the bronze tree, especially for the shape of the bronze tree. I still remember right at the beginning during the excavation, people can hardly recognize it is a tree. And there are a lot of discussion on what is this object. And this time during the excavation, I believe many mysteries have been unveiled. Actually, I have a lot of questions behind the bronze ware. And actually, I would like to have a preview. And in the upcoming two days, we will also invite uh, Nan Pai San Shu to join our program. And actually, today, when we are connecting him is because he appeared in the searches for the internet. So in the future, um, if you have time, maybe you should pay more attention to our special program to unveil the mystery of San Xing Dui. So I believe uh, you are working you need a lot of uh, inspiration and creations. So maybe if you look at the special program, it will help you with your writing. I think it is quite lucky for me because in this era, I'm quite impressed by these major discoveries of San Xingdui. 
I think in the past we have many mysteries. And from today, and I believe many of those mysteries will be uncovered. We hope all of those questions and mysteries can be uncovered. Thank you very much. Maybe we will have more conversation a couple of days later. All right, we will continue our evening show. So actually today is quite windy. And in the past few days, Chengdu is very hot and feels like it's about to enter into summer. But right now, we are going to unveil the mystery of San Xingdui. And right now, Chengdu is getting rainy and windy. So when we are sitting here, it feels like a lot of history is actually getting to the service. So we also encourage all of the viewers to join us for our special program. For example, if you have any questions or any comments, please leave it in our social media platform. And also, you can write up some of your expectation. So now we will enter into a special show. We will connect with Feng Mantian, one of very uh, famous performer and a composer. And I believe you have been following our special program very closely. Yes. Mr. Feng is one of the old friends with CCTV. And also, he's a lover of Chinese culture and the Chinese civilization. And this time, I hear that uh, actually you are writing, composing music for the mystery of San Xingdui. So what impressed you most for the San Xingdui culture? Well, actually, I was quite inspired by the ancient people's aspiration to God and also the pursuit of art of the ancient people. By looking at the bronzeware and the objects on Earth, I could see a lot of spirits have been passed uh, from these objects. I could see the aesthetic appearance of Chinese people, and also I can see the spirit of Chinese people. So actually, it echoes with the artist nowadays, because we need to stay true to our to the original aspiration. I still impressed by the totem that has been created in the bronzeware. I'm quite impressed by the mindset of the ancient people and their state of the spirit. For us, we just have a lot of imagination about the state of the mindset of the ancient people. And this time, you actually compose a music to talk about the mystery of San Xingdui. We all know that San Xingdui site is quite mysterious. And we all know that for the San Xingdui civilization, it is only one of the civilization in China, even though it shares the same origin with the Chinese civilization. So maybe when you compose the music, you just try to convey this kind of mysterious and also the strength of San Xingdui. Yes, indeed. When we are looking at the burial objects on Earth from San Xingdui, I can feel the power and the strength of the ancient people, the Shu people, even though they look very rough, but if you look at the burial objects, they are quite delicate. And also, I can tell their worship to God. I think based on all of those feelings, we try to compose a music so that it can better convey the spirit of San Xingdui site. We have been discussing San Xingdui for a long time. I can't wait to play the music. All right, I would like to turn over to Feng Mantian. Let's enjoy the music. So this is a theme music 
to unveil the mystery of San Xing Dui. Welcome Mr. Feng Mantian and his team.
继续和我们来关注直播，在这儿呢要感谢冯满天老师和他的朋友们给我们带来的这样一段演出啊！我觉得可能每一个音乐人在去触碰历史的时候，他所心中感受到的那个环节是不一样的啊！不知道大家对于这段音乐的感触又是什么？能不能够激起您心中对于三星堆更多的遐想？好，继续我们的直播节目啊！接下来呢，我们将会说到的其实呢，是今天我们说三星堆文化的前世今生。当时隔三十多年之后再一次去开启挖掘的时候，我们关注到的是一件件精美的文物及它背后所携带的信息。但是，我们要去补充一下三星堆的这个文化的脉络。其实，我们现在所说到的三星堆考古发掘，包括大家可能在博物馆里所看到的，无论是动物面具。啊，青铜立人像还是我们这些神树以及很多的这种玉器，大部分都是在一九八六年的发掘过程当中，在一二号地基坑里发现的。但其实这并不是三星堆文化最早的和我们见面的一个时间段。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生，当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。当时我们说到的是三星堆文化的前世今生。历史在等待着我们。接下来是我们呃每天节目当中一个特别的板块，我们会有一个博物馆的奇妙夜，派出一位我们的记者朋友去帮我们探一探夜间的博物馆。在所有游客离去之后，博物馆里这些沉睡的文物是否会说话？他们是否会动？他们会给我们带来怎样的一些信息呢？接下来我们将会去看到的这件文物就来自于燕家院子。观众朋友们，大家好！我们现在来到的呢是位于四川省广汉市三星堆博物馆的文保中心。那在我身旁的这位呢，就是四川大学博物馆科创中心的主任张庭。张老师您好。啊，那张老师， so、咱们今天夜探博物馆的主角就是我们身旁的这个文物吗？嗯，对，这是我们馆藏的最珍贵的文物——大石壁。Late night visit to the museum. 大石壁。And this one is actually quite unique. And this is the stone book. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the relation of those two objects? Because this one is the one that is the most famous. So what is the Stone disc, and they're contacting the curator of the Museum of Sichuan University, and then when they are the continue to look into the stone disc, they said that this kind of disc. Is actually from the Shang Dynasty. So actually, that is the starting point for our excavation work. So if we look closer on the stone disc, we can see three characters. 
so I believe in the Shu Dynasty, I think there's no language. So what is that? Well, actually, for these um, three characters, it is not cast by ancient people. It's actually cast by the farmer who discovers this stone disk. So for the farmer, back in the 1920s, when he was digging the ditch, he accidentally found this stone disk. So for the farmer, at that time, he thinks that this one must be a treasure. And he actually um, sent some of this treasure to his friends. And also he picked some of the unique relics and also bring those relics to the Museum of Sichuan University. And at that time, the curator was quite happy to receive the disc. So um, this is the um, character carved by the people who discovered the stone disc. So this is the story about this stone disc. So actually, I'm quite uh, curious about this stone. It looks like the regular size of the stone. So what is the function of the stone disc? So we have kids doing a lot of research about the disc. Some people are saying for this kind of disc, it has a different size and a different shape. So for the largest one, it has a diameter of around like 70 centimeters, and for this one, it's about like 54 centimeters, and for the small disc, it is only 10 centimeters as the disc. So people are saying maybe it is used for measurement, but um, you could not suit up to the test. And for some people, um, some musicians and commissioners, they are thinking maybe this is a musical instrument in the ancient times. Still, it's open for discussion for the function of the stone disc. So even though it just looks like a stone, but behind it, it carries a lot of civilization. So I think uh, Sichuan University Museum has done a lot of work to preserve the stone disc. What we need to do in the future to preserve this kind of cultural relics. And this time, we are seeing more new discoveries are coming out from Sanxing Dui site. And experts coming from China and the world are coming here to look at those new discoveries. We have experts from different disciplines to better understand the relics from Sanxing Dui. I believe with the joint efforts of these experts, it is possible that uh, we will unveil the mystery of the stone disc. Thank you very much for the evening tour to the museum. So actually the stone disc is com com coming earlier than the relics from 1986. And right now, again, we will connect another aspect. We will connect curator Mr. Huo Wei from the Museum of Sichuan University. Good evening. Can you hear me? Please turn on your microphone so we can hear you in just a few moments. Yes, it's loud. Right, maybe we just wait for a few minutes because it is a technical issue. Maybe we will have 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 a technical issue. Maybe we will I believe the discoveries in the discovery of Sanxing Dui are not only important in China, but also important to the world.
So, so I would like to show you knows, the video really of our interview with, Chinese with the professor. And have been doing academic research for over 20 years in China. So what impressed you most when you first came to Sanxingdui? And do you think that there are some interesting, interesting things you found during your research? In the Sanxingdui period, it seems like the entire Chengdu Plain has been integrated into a larger social sphere, a community, yes, a bigger civilization. And Sanxingdui was a core part of that. Um, one of the very interesting finds from Sanxingdui is the elephant tusks that were found in the two pits that were excavated um, in the 1980s. In those two pits, there are more than 80 individual tusks. Um, and one of the very interesting things about the tusks is that they come um, from the Asian elephant. Um, and Asian elephants, uh, you have tusks only in the males and they're territorial animals. So it is very unlikely that you have that many elephants in one area. It's much more likely that the elephants were distributed across the plain and in other areas. And so having so many elephant tusks in one place shows that the people at Sanxingdui were able to bring in tribute from across Sichuan, from many different places to, to one central place. Obviously, there are other lines of evidence that show the, the reach of the Sanxingdui community as well. The jade raw material that was coming from uh, up in the Minjiang, in the, in the mountains to the west of Sichuan, of, of Chengdu Plain, um, is another line of evidence that shows the reach of the community at Sanxingdui. But I find the elephants really interesting because they correspond with this pattern of settlements that shows that Sanxingdui has become a central place for a large area. So it's like a, we call it CBD today. Like Sanxingdui is a CBD uh, during the, it's that time in the Chengdu Plain. Yes, it's, I mean, it is, um, it is this place that is of paramount importance and unlike the places that preceded it. So it, it represents a transformation of the society within the Sichuan Basin. The, the, the Ji Sikong at, at, at Sanqing Bay, the, uh, the, the pits that have been discovered and, the, and presumably the new one that is being excavated now, um, those are um, big deposits of much of lots of, of, uh, of material that was intentionally destroyed at one moment in time. I mean, at several moments in time, but at a few occasions of major sacrifice. Whereas if we look at the uh, material from Jinsha, um, the uh, sacrificial deposits there, which in, in some ways are similar to Sanqingdui, they have elephant tusks. Some of them include gold, they're jade objects, they're little figurines, but they're much smaller. And there are many of them. And, and also you've mentioned that there are more than 80 elephant tusks have been found in the Sanxingdui set. But uh, do you think that the oh, ancient Shu people was very smart to do the, like, the commerce? The how, how do you <laughs> think they, they did these things? So I think it is really interesting. I don't think it's a miracle. And I think one of the things we learn from archaeology no matter where you do archaeology and what time period, is it starts to help understand how people in the ancient past or people in very different places in some ways are quite similar to um, people today, um, is to understand how these phenomena are not miracles, but are the result of intelligent um, human beings just like us living lives that are informed by social interactions, are informed by decision making and um, weighing the costs and benefits of different types of uh, behavior. So, for example, the elephant tusks, what it, rep it was important to do was represent the connections between people and places. And so when you bring a tusk, if you give a tusk to someone, you are showing a deep 
degree of connection to them because you, it is something that is very valuable representative of the um of your of your place in the world of the of the experiences of your surroundings um and then you can imagine in one place that people are seeing as this uh, important central place, the city, the, the Shanghai or New York um, or Beijing that people will want to come to and want to have connections to, that you can establish a connection by bringing something like that um, with you when you visit. You've mentioned that the Sanxing Dui set is really a place that needs many archaeologists to find what is in that site. And we also have some small models like like this one? Can you see that? <laughs> what impressed you most when you first came to Sanxing Dui? I think actually I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the models and the masks because there are aspects of them that impressed me the most, I think, because they are so important and they're so different from the bronzes that were known from everywhere else contemporary with them. But that really struck me in person when I first saw it was how different the um, symbolism on the many heads was. And it's perhaps most obvious in the hairstyles. All of those heads have one of several different hairstyles or, or, or headdresses. Um, and there is also somewhat detailed differences in terms of their um, facial um, uh, structure. The Sanxingue sculptures are not very realistic, but they're clearly human. Uh, they're, they, are, they have a realism to them but they are generic in the sense that they are representing several different types of people. Do you think that the, nowadays the recent research can explain the question like it, I mean, it depends on what you mean by the Shu people. If we are going to associate Sanxingdui with Shu, which already is a little bit problematic because the Shu we know from historical texts is from later historical texts. And they are reconstructing our understanding of the Sichuan Basin based on oral history. And if we think of Sanxingdui as the part of the story of the Shu origins, then the question of Gu Shu Ren Son Nali Lai is a question of where Sanxingdui Ren Son Nali Lai. And the Sanxingdui Ren are clearly, in some fashion, descendants to it, at least to a degree, of the Baodun uh, Hua Ren like the people associated with the Baudun culture. So the Sanxingdui people have a connection with that earlier millennium of Neolithic societies. The Gushu Ren Dao Nali Chu, again, depends on what you mean. I mean, to some extent, the Gushu Ren didn't go anywhere. <laughs> they, they, they remained in the Chengdu Plain. They are at least part of the communities that uh, created the Shara Chao culture. And so uh, now, of course, I don't mean to suggest that people didn't move out and in. There was, we know from all across Asia that there was a lot of movement of people and migration throughout prehistory. I also don't mean to suggest that there was, it was a peaceful process of just one cultural transition to the next. I think there was probably quite a bit of violence in the, in the Sichuan Basin um, even before there was conflict with communities outside of the Sichuan Basin. Um, but uh, to some degree, the even communities that were destroyed are part of the legacy and the history that um, led to the stories that we hear about Shu, about the Gu Shu Ren. I think one of the biggest significances of the um, Shu people as a whole, of the Sanxingdui right, uh, site specifically, <laughs> is that from these sorts of discoveries, we learn about how um, complicated and diverse the um, communities of the ancient world are, uh, and how um, interwoven the stories of different communities become in order to uh, feed into a later historical narrative. And you mentioned Liangzhu, that's another perfect example of 
a an important, incredibly interesting、uh, site. 好的，欢迎各位继续回到我们的直播现场啊！很显然，我们今天的直播。Welcome back to our evening show. Actually, we're running over time. Thank you, my colleague, for her interview with the professor from the Harvard University. Actually, we hear a lot about the civilization of ancient Shu Kingdom, or also the Shi Er Qiao civilization. And actually, he speaks very good Chinese. And he actually raised a lot of opinion. He talks about、uh, for the Sanxing Dynasty civilization and also the Jingsha Site civilization. Uh, maybe they have like correlation with the surrounding areas, and then they're able to collect some of the elephant tusks. The reason why we are talking about the civilization is because we find there are many mysteries there, and then we're able to find out the answers to unlock those mysteries. And now we will continue to、uh, connect the、uh, curator of the Museum of Sichuan University. Mr. Huawei, good evening. Right, I can hear you right now. My first question: I heard that you also personally participate in the excavation work in Sanxingdui back in 1986. So, what is your title back then? At that time, I actually I just obtained a master degree. I actually bring my students for interns. To participate in the excavation work, I work together with、uh, Mr. Chen, the leader of the excavation team, and we are forming a working group to guide the excavation work in 1986. So at that time, I'm just a TA to facilitate with the excavation in 1986. Also, I witnessed the great discoveries found in Sanxingdui back in 1986. And right now, the Museum of Sichuan、uh, University is underestimated because I know right now we are renovating the Museum of Sichuan University, and later it will become the new landmark in Sichuan Province. Since the founding of People's Republic of China, the Museum of Sichuan University used to be considered as a archaeology institute in Sichuan Province. When you are Uh, visiting the Sanxingdui site in 1986, did you find any correlation of the relics unearthed from Sanxingdui with the、um, relics unearthed earlier in Sanjiayuanzi? Well, there may be some interruption of the signal because Mr. Hu. Is actually on his business travel. All right, welcome to have you back. At the early stage of the discovery of Sanxingdui, <laughs> well, we lost him again. Just wait for a few minutes. At the earlier stage of the discovery of the Sanxingdui site, it's very important. And I want to mention a time that is 1929. We have found some important discoveries back in 1929. But actually, I see a very strange phenomenon. For the objects on Earth back in 1929. They all linked to sacrificial activities. For example, we talk about the stone disc. We have several stone discs found back in 1920s. We all know the discs always considered as the ritual vessels, and also we found other kinds of sacrificial objects. For example, the tablets, the jade piece, the bronzeware. So we may have a speculation. So even though we found some objects、uh, from 1920s, and these objects may have some relation to the sacrifice. So maybe these people are using these objects for sacrifice. Maybe they're using different objects. So you, as a researcher or a archaeologist, this time we reopen the discovery for pit number three to number eight. So what is your expectation? 
Some people may say that um, today we found some pieces of the gold mask, and also some people are expecting that we may able to find another half of the gold mask. And some people are saying that um, this time we are able to find large size bronze mask. So this may be more significant to us. And some people are saying if we are able to find some of the language, so that would be much better for our studies. So what is your focus? So back in 1920s, it is the first time that we unearthed some of the objects from San Xingdui site. But right now, we still need to have a clear understanding of the San Xingdui civilization. I'm so glad that I personally participate in the excavation work in 1986. The most important mission for us is to unlock the mystery of this ancient civilization. You mentioned language or written record. I think this is very important for us. And also, no matter how many bronzeware or jadeware or goldware we find, we still need to have a clear understanding of the civilization. For example, we need to understand the significance of the bronze culture in China or even the bronze culture in the world. This time, we are so impressed by some of the relics unearthed from San Xingdui site is because some of the relics we have never seen before. That's why we think it is quite impressive and it has bring up new mysteries to all of us. For some of the archaeologists, they are coming up a lot of speculations. And for some of the students, they also have a lot of inspiration and imagination. But still, we need to do a lot of scientific work to get to the root of the history behind the San Xingdui civilization. I think the most important thing is that um, the discovery for San Xingdui may have an influence to the world. There were several significance for the discoveries. First, it, have give, it has given a fresher look to the bronze culture in China. In the past, we only see the bronze uh, weapons and also the ritual vessels. But this time, when we look at the bronzeware from San Xingdui, we have a lot of sacrificial objects. For example, we have the bronze mask, bronze tree, and the bronze statue. So it enriched the civilization of the bronze culture in China. And second, it identifies that the diversity of the civilization in China, because San Xingdui only represents one of the civilization in China, but also it shares the same origin with the Chinese civilization. I think with the um, excavation work today, we can unlock more mysteries of San Xingdui site. So I believe you're eager to come back and make a personal visit to the excavation site in San Xingdui. Right, once again, the signal was interrupted. So as Mr. Huo is actually um, have a business travel right now, I believe he is quite eager to come back to San Xingdui to understand more about the relics and the excavation. All right, I would like to repeat my question. Now you will travel outside. When will you come back to Chengdu? Probably I will be back in Chengdu. So maybe by no time you will pay a visit to the San Xingdui site and then to experience the charm of the San Xingdui civilization. I'm so glad that uh, this time we have a team dispatched from the Museum of Sichuan University. We work together with other universities to do the archaeological excavation work on site. And for myself, I would like to return to San Xingdui site because I used to work there. I would like to experience this festive vibe at the San Xingdui site. Thank you very much. So actually, um, in the upcoming three days, we also have the interview program. 
If there's a chance, welcome you to join us for the interview program. Thank you again for your introduction and your insight. All right. As the special program today has already run over time, as we talk about San Xingdui, I think um, we need more time for the discussion. So I believe if we have the live footage from the excavation site, I believe many people would like to stay in front of the television to watch the progress of the excavation. And actually, in this morning, we all say that uh, for this, the San Xingdui civilization it not just represents the ancient civilization, it is actually one of the civilizations in China and shares the same origin with the Chinese civilization. And in the upcoming few days, we will continue to follow closely with the new discoveries of San Xingdui. So tomorrow, same time, same place, and we will have another evening show of San Xingdui. Let us stay together to unveil the mystery of San Xingdui site. See you tomorrow.